Coming up on Mayo Clinic Q&A. The vast majority of bladder cancer patients are diagnosed with cancer that's not imminently life-threatening, but they tend to be aggressive. With bladder cancer, early detection is critical for treatment. High-grade bladder cancer tends to spread quickly and can become life-threatening, but there are treatment options. There are other ways of treating this disease, including radiation therapy, so patients can get radio-sensitizing chemotherapy, so chemotherapy that makes the radiation more effective. There's a lot of options, treatment of aggressive muscle invasive bladder cancer. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic Q&A. I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. May is Bladder Cancer Awareness Month, an important time to raise awareness about a disease that affects more than 80,000 Americans annually. Most bladder cancers are diagnosed at an early stage when the cancer is highly treatable. But even early stage bladder cancers need to be followed because they have a tendency to recur. People with bladder cancer typically need follow-up tests for years after their diagnosis and treatment. Joining us to discuss this today is Dr. Mark Tyson, a urologist at Mayo Clinic. Thanks for being here today, Mark. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm excited to learn about bladder cancer since we have a whole month dedicated to it. Tell us a little bit about bladder cancer. What does it mean to have bladder cancer? Does it start in the bladder itself or does it come from somewhere else? It usually starts in the bladder. Um, the vast majority of bladder cancer patients are diagnosed with cancer that's not imminently life-threatening, but they tend to be aggressive. So bladder cancers, even if they're not life-threatening when they're first diagnosed, tend to recur and, uh, and, and, and sometimes cause the patient to have to undergo numerous procedures and treatments and those kinds of things. There is a subset, probably about 20% of patients who, who do have an aggressive and invasive form of the disease that requires more aggressive treatments. And in those cases, it can be life-threatening. What causes people to get bladder cancer, Mark, and who is at risk? We, we think that about 50% of all bladder cancers are caused by smoking. Uh, it comes to uh, most patients as a surprise to learn that because they usually think of smoking as a disease uh -huh. uh, that affects the lungs. But uh, indeed, the, the chemicals that are inhaled are excreted into the bladder and, and uh, held into the bladder uh, before they're voided. Uh, and that causes uh, changes to, to, the, to the urethelium, um, which really occurs anywhere along the urinary tract from the kidneys all the way down to the tip of the urethra. Um, and so bladder cancer itself tends to be the most common site of urethelial carcinoma, which is, you know, urethelium is the inner lining of the bladder, but urethelium, um, like I said, is anywhere along that tract. And so you can develop a urethelial carcinoma, much like a bladder cancer in the kidneys or the ureters, which is the tube that drains the kidneys or the urethra. So, so the smoking uh, is the most important risk factor, mm -hmm. uh, but there are others too. Um, we, we think that particularly patients that were raised in uh, rural communities where um, uh, there are pesticides mm -hmm. in the groundwater, arsenic-based pesticides, um, lots of folks live on wells. They, they tap those wells. Like my parents live in a well in a farming community. Yes. I grew up um, with a well as well. Yeah. And so, and so, um, it, it could be something in the water supply. Uh, it could be something, um, in, uh, occupations. So hmm. I've had a couple patients that hairdressers work around dyes. Oh, interesting. Um, you know, one wonders about the association there. We know that folks that work in factories around, uh, textiles, um, around brake parts, um, some of these automotive fluids, um, they, they, they're thought to be associated as well. There's a whole host of things that, 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 are, that are lightly associated to bladder cancer, but we know for sure that the vast majority of bladder cancers are caused by smoking. It sounds like, it, it feels to me like we learn all of the time of something else that's caused by smoking. Yeah, exactly. It's a bad, probably a good it's a thing problem. to give up. Yeah, bad problem. Exactly. So Mark, what are the signs and symptoms? What would people notice if they might need to be um, uh, evaluated for bladder cancer? Usually it's bleeding. So um, okay. patients will usually either be told that they have blood in the urine uh, on a test that's done by a primary care physician or otherwise, or they'll see uh, blood in their urine. And those types of uh, situations uh, require uh, immediate urologic evaluation. Um, this is one of the, and I know we'll talk about this a little later, but this is one of the big problems with delays in diagnosis. Um, we think that there's something else that's causing the bleeding and, and we delay a urologic evaluation, which can lead to delays in care. 
So if bleeding occurs, it, it does require immediate attention. Um, there are other sort of um, s things that patients will sometimes notice when they're uh, first diagnosed, and that might be a change in their urinary symptoms. This isn't a common presentation, but frequency and urgency and nocturia, particularly those irritative voiding symptoms, are a little more common with pretty aggressive disease. We'll see this more commonly with some of this, the variants, not necessarily the, the routine urothelial carcinomas, but some of the more esoteric um, types of the disease. Those can sometimes present with um, dramatic changes in, in voiding function, but generally it's bleeding. Mark, are there screening tests for bladder cancer? And then I want to ask you to clarify something. Does a screening test mean that someone has no signs or symptoms, but they get the test? There's not a widely used screening test. There are some potential urinary uh, biomarkers that could be okay. used for screening and that are being explored in that setting. But um, there's nothing right now that, that one could show up to their primary care doctor and say, I'd like to get a bladder cancer test. Um, urinalysis is one that we kind of think of most commonly, um, but it, there's not really um, a lot um, proven with respect to urinalysis. Um, it's helpful to detect blood, but there's a lot of people that have blood for other reasons. And so that would probably lead to more invasive testing than, that, than, than is necessary. Um, but there are other urinary biomarkers that are more specific um, that, that measure um, genomic patterns or changes in expression mm. of genes um, that, that could be used in the setting, but they're not validated. So right now, presently, there's not, nothing that can be done in the asymptomatic population. Um, it really is just a, a wait and see kind of approach at the moment. So a screening test, you said asymptomatic, that means someone who may worry that they're at risk but they don't have any of those signs or symptoms we talked about. That's when you do a screening test. Is that right? Right. And we often get, we'll get patients who are worried because a family member has developed bladder cancer. Um, oh, sure. And yeah. And what I, what I tell those folks is that they're, they're right to be worried, especially if they live together, uh, because we know that most mm -hmm. of these cancers aren't necessarily inherited germline mutations, uh, something that they inherited from their parents, although they are at times. Most of the time when these cancers run in the family, it's because of shared environmental risk factors. They drank from the same well. They sat in the same car, smelling the same secondhand smoke. They did all the same things growing up with the same exposures. And that tends to be the reason why it runs in families. For patients that have significant family histories, I don't think it's totally unreasonable to do a, a screening year analysis once a year, although there's no evidence that I could cite to, to suggest that that's beneficial. Okay. So Mark, moving on, supposing that we have an individual who has some of the worrisome signs and symptoms, maybe blood in their urine, for instance, how do you diagnose bladder cancer? It's not fun uh, for patients. Generally, uh, it requires a scope uh, in the mm. urethra, which can be painful. So you mean a camera? Um, yeah, like a colonoscopy, um, but it's done through the urethra. Um, unlike a colonoscopy, it doesn't require sedation. Um, but patients will come into the office. They've had enough complained of blood in their urine. Um, we'll set them up for an in-office cystoscopy, which is just a tiny camera that we introduce into the urethra. And we look at the bladder, we look at the urethra, um, and, and, and we detect bladder cancer, or ureter, urethral cancer in that way. It's very important though, that patients who've had blood in the urine also get what's called an upper tract evaluation. So we can't see the kidneys and the ureters. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not a common presentation of urothelial carcinoma, but it is, um, it is a presentation to develop tumors in the kidney or the ureter. And so a CT scan, and specifically a CT urogram, which is three phases of a CT scan, um, is important for the diagnosis of an upper tract urothelial carcinoma. So it's, it's really three tests for gross hematuria, so blood that you see in the urine, it would be that cystoscopy in the office, a CT urogram, and then a cytology. And then cytology is uh, the urine that a pathologist will evaluate under a microscope. Those three tests are the sort of linchpin of, 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 of uh, bladder cancer. Now, Mark, supposing that an individual is diagnosed, are there lots of different types uh, of bladder cancer? And then how do you treat it? The most common type of bladder cancer is urothelial carcinoma. Um, 
over 90% of, of bladder cancers will either be a urethelial uh, carcinoma or a urethelial predominant kind of carcinoma. Um, and like I said, and that can happen anywhere along the anatomy. But there are other types of the disease that are important to remember, and, and those can be what we call variant histologies. Um, oftentimes, these are urethelial carcinomas that uh, have um, other types of, of, of uh, appearances under my, other types of histologic appearances concomitant with the urethelial carcinoma, like a micropapillary differentiation or a plasma cytoid. If you, if you get diagnosed with those types of cancers, the stakes are elevated because they're generally more aggressive. Um, and there's a lot of different types of variants. And then there's the rare type of, of non-urethelial um, primary uh, bladder cancer. So like an adenocarcinoma, which mm -hmm. usually occurs um, uh, you know, at the urachus, but doesn't always. You can have non uracal primary adenos of the bladder, which are pretty rare. What's the urachus, Mark? Oh, I'm very sorry. Yes, so the the part of the bladder, the dome, where the where uh, okay. it, the bladder connects to the to the belly butt. Basically. Okay, you are getting into a lot of words, uh, histologic words, meaning yeah. the cells under the microscope there that right. were kind of going above my head. But <laughs> but needless to say, there are multiple types and cell types, although there is one type that's most common. Exactly. Yeah. Um, we, 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 we see lots of different types of, of, of cancers, particularly um, at, at, a, at a, a tertiary medical center where, you know, people are coming in, mm -hmm. they'll often be diagnosed with cancers that, that are rare in that way. And, and they require, a, you know, special considerations because they sometimes don't respond to the typical chemotherapies that we use to the typical intravesical therapy. So that sometimes when patients who are not, we haven't gotten here yet, but Sometimes patients are treated with 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 um, treatments that are put inside the bladder, and uh, and they sometimes don't respond in the same way that the the routine urethelial carcinomas respond. So tell us about the basics of treatment. What what should an individual expect? So um, it's before you decide on what the best treatment is. We we generally will classify bladder cancers according to grade and stage. So those are the two most important pieces that, that one needs to know before knowing what to do next. So after this tumor is diagnosed in the office, um, the patient is taken to the operating room and we'll put them to sleep and then we'll take the tumor out endoscopically. So no incisions, we'll put a scope into the bladder and then we'll resect the tumor. Um, and we try to get the whole tumor out at that time. And then a couple of days later, we get the PATH report and that PATH report really decides what the next treatments are. Um, the vast majority of these cancers will be non-muscle invasive, so they're not invading into the second layer of the bladder, but they're just either on the surface or into the first layer. Those treatments um, generally are intravesical, so patients will, will come in for a couple of months, um, up to a couple of years, and get a catheter and then treatment put inside their bladder, and then that helps mitigate the risk of cancer coming back or progressing. Mm -hmm. and then so on the other Mark, end, the same yeah. way that you went in with the scope and in with the device to, to either biopsy or to cut out the tumor, that's how the, the chemotherapy is instilled as well. Exactly. In, through the urine tube and into the urethra and into the bladder. Okay. Exactly. For non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, which is the most common, those patients are going to have um, intravesical treatment. So treatment put inside okay. the bladder. It's done in the office with our nurses. Um, a catheter gets put in, the medication gets instilled, and then it generally walk around with it for a couple of hours and then void it out. The, there are a couple of different options in this space, um, um, generally for high-grade disease. So even among the non-muscle invasive designation, there's high-grade and low-grade, which tells the, the patient and the provider how aggressive and how likely the cancer is to come back again in the future. And for high-grade disease, it's more likely for the cancer to come back again in the future. And so we try to head that off at the pass with this intravesical treatment. And for those patients, we generally use something called BCG. It's a bacteria, Bacillus calmet carrerin. Mm -hmm. It's named after a couple of French immunologists who at the turn of the 20th century were studying vaccines for tuberculosis. So in the late 19th century, we learned that tuberculosis was infectious. Mm -hmm. And then these two scientists spent a couple of decades um, developing this bacteria that's closely related to the bacteria that causes tuberculosis as a vaccine. In the 1920s, we used it as a vaccine in children. Um, there were a couple of 
uh, safety and political setbacks for a couple of decades, but by the 1950s, there had been wide dissemination, widespread dissemination of the vaccine across the world. And to this day, we use that vaccine as an intravesical treatment. The story behind that's actually quite interesting, if I may have a minute to explain. Yes, that's very interesting. The yes, 19, yeah, 1950s and 60s, we learned that this, this vaccine had anti-cancer properties. Um, and in the 1970s, we learned that it had anti-bladder cancer properties. So uh, a Canadian urologist took it off the shelf and, and had seen some of the preliminary preclinical data and said, let's just try it in bladder cancer. He had six vaccines. He puts six sequential installations over a six week period into uh, a small a number of patients. And there were impressive response rates. Hmm. Some additional studies were convincing enough that um, um, some large federally funded studies were done in the 1980s. And then two products in the, in the early 1990s were finally uh, brought to the market and FDA approved 1991 and 1992. So we've been using this BCG for decades and it's been FDA approved in, in, in this country for decades. Well, that's so it's highly, amazing. Yeah, and it's highly effective. So 65% of patients at two years will have a complete response. It never um, ceases to amaze me how people figure things out that they work. And for a hundred bucks too, it's cheap, you know, in terms, of, <laughs> in terms of cancer therapies, it's quite cheap. So anyway, so for patients with high grade, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, BCG is generally the best option, not always, but generally. Um, but there are other options in this space, like chemotherapies and those kinds of things. BCG is in short supply right now. Um, and so mm. if you're not able to get it, an intravesical chemotherapy is a suitable alternative. Um, and then there's the muscle invasive side. So we talked a lot about non-muscle invasive. Then there's the muscle invasive side. So if it's stage two or higher, stage two, three, or four, generally the treatments need to be more aggressive. For cancer that's confined to the bladder, stage two or stage three, maybe in the fat around the bladder, um, those patients are best treated with chemotherapy upfront. Um, generally speaking, followed by removal of the bladder. Now I'm a urologist, oh. so there's some bias there, mm -hmm. um, but but we we think that the the best way to cure this cancer in, in particularly younger, healthier folks is, is to do cisplatinum based is the type of chemotherapy combination chemotherapy first three, four cycles followed by removal of the bladder and then urinary diversion, which we can talk about urinary diversion if, if there's time, but, um, but there are other ways of treating this disease, including radiation therapy. So patients can get radio sensitizing chemotherapy. So chemotherapy that makes the radiation more effective um, followed by concurrent radiation therapy. And there's actually some innovative protocols right now studying additional um, concurrent medications like immunotherapy in combination with mm. chemotherapy and radiation. So there's a lot of options for yes. treatment of aggressive muscle invasive mm. bladder cancer. Um, but generally speaking, muscle invasive bladder cancer requires more aggressive treatment. Mark, is it common for bladder cancer to spread to other places in the body to metastasize? It is at stage two. Um, it's pretty common. We see that about 30% of the time, stage two, um, stage three, north of 50%. And obviously stage four is disease that has spread to other sites of the body. So um, it's an aggressive disease when it's at that stage. Even stage one, it's important to remember, stage one bladder cancer is invasive. Um, so a lot of patients will get stage one non-muscle mm. invasive bladder cancer and think, well, there's no risk to doing BCG. We should just do BCG. But in fact, I always have that conversation with patients. There's a 15% chance that disease is metastatic at the stage one um, mm. uh, diagnosis. So We've, it's a very aggressive cancer. You've said a lot, Mark. In fact, my head is a little bit spinning, so I can only yeah. imagine listeners. Um, this, imagine how confusing this would be to someone who's trying to figure out whether they're getting the best therapy. How does a patient know whether they're getting appropriate therapy and whether they're getting the best therapy that they could for their bladder cancer? Yeah, that's a very difficult um, thing to know when, when, even if you're highly medically literate and, and, and you've studied the literature, there, there are instances where there might be some confusion, particularly in the BCG unresponsive non-muscle invasive space, which we haven't even talked about. But I would say second and third opinions are very helpful in that regard. You and know, do we do pretty, that at Mayo Clinic? We do, yes, of course. And we'd be happy um, to do, I do video visits all the time for people who desire okay. second and third. And I, and I know my colleagues across the enterprise do the same. So um, we'd we, um, be happy to give second and, and third and, and fourth opinions. But generally speaking, the sort of the 
initial diagnosis of non-muscle invasive disease is pretty straightforward. And the initial diagnosis of muscle invasive, so stage two is pretty, di is pretty straightforward. And stage four is for the most part, pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. There are certain instances where we may not be able to do the typical thing that we try to offer in those spaces, in which case that might be where one would benefit from kind of a second opinion. And I know, Mark, that in a lot of um, cancer specialty specialties, patients will choose to come here sometimes either to initiate their therapy to um, get a second opinion, and then often go home to complete that therapy. Is that true in this situation as well? Yes, the vast majority of our um, patients will complete their chemotherapy locally. Um, they'll see our medical oncologists and get, an, get a recommendation for uh, the type of chemotherapy and the number of cycles, and then they'll go back home to get that. And a lot of the patients that we treat for non-muscle invasive disease will get their BCG or their intravesical therapy at home as well, and then come back for periodic surveillance or um, I, a lot of patients that just check in every six months just to say this is the recent uh, and they check in by video. This is the mm -hmm. recent. This is the recent um, developments. I'm doing well, and then I'll say, okay, here's what's on the horizon, and what you can anticipate. You know, Plan A, Plan B, and Plan C. And then if any of those things happen, just call me, and we can um, sort it out. Very reassuring to patients, I imagine, to have more heads um, together thinking about their diagnosis and their their process that they're going through. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. Mark, tell us about survival rates for bladder cancer. At the stage zero, so stage one, you know, the non-muscle invasive um, stage, it's very good. The vast majority of patients are going to survive their disease. These are typically diseases that recur, but don't necessarily recur in a life-threatening fashion. So they're more like a nuisance, like a skin cancer in that respect. Mm -hmm. The whole skin has been exposed to the sun and it's just a matter of time before another one somewhere along the skin develops. And the same is true for bladder cancer. For, the mo for most patients with non-muscle invasive disease, they tend to recur over time, but tend to not be life-threatening. For muscle invasive disease, if the patient has a good response to chemotherapy, uh, and we remove their bladder and find no residual disease, that portends an excellent survival. North of 85% of those patients are going to survive their disease. Um, but if they don't have a great response to chemotherapy and there's persistent muscle invasive disease, then the survival is a, a little less um, robust. Patients in that setting will experience a five-year survival of somewhere in the ballpark of 60 to 65%. If patients are metastatic at the time of cystectomy, um, generally, we, which means the cancer has spread, we generally will put them on additional therapy after removal of the bladder. And I have lots of patients who've been diagnosed with lymph node positive disease. So they're metastatic, the cancer has spread to the lymph nodes, and they'll be on immunotherapy for years with no evidence oh. of disease progression. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily portend a guaranteed uh, adverse um, outcome, mm -hmm. but um, it generally speaking, when the cancer has spread, survival is poor. Mark, patients often want to know, do we provide any clinical trials or do we have any ongoing clinical trials at Mayo Clinic uh, for bladder cancer? Absolutely. There's a robust clinical trial um, uh, portfolio across the entire enterprise. My colleagues in Florida and Rochester and here in Arizona, I have assembled a really interesting um, group of, of clinical trials um, studying everything from chemotherapies prior to surgery um, to uh, new drugs that we're adding concurrently with radiation um, to new therapies for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, new types of BCG, new approaches to low-grade diseases. We didn't even talk about low-grade but new approaches to low-grade diseases. We've got clinical trials in the space where people aren't eligible for chemotherapy or aren't eligible for surgery or radiation. We've got clinical trials in people who have progressed on chemotherapy. Across the entire enterprise is essentially a trial for every space that exists with this wow. disease. And Mark, we, we were talking about clinical trials, which basically means it involves patients, but a lot of research goes on, we call bench research that goes on Maybe it doesn't involve patients, it's on the cells um, or uh, other um, aspects of bladder cancer. Do we have research studies like that at Mayo as well? 
We do. We have uh, biobanks um, where we do urinary um, uh, biomarker research. There's um, space being done in the urinary microbiome uh, uh, research is, or research being done in the urinary microbiome space. And then we have um, uh, PhD colleagues across the enterprise as well that collaborate on um, correlative type uh, research or translational aims. The, the clinical trial um, portfolios is definitely more robust than the bench research, but there is definitely bench research being done. Mark, at Mayo Clinic, we always say that the needs of the patient come first, and we, we believe that, and we live that, yeah. and we treat patients that way. We've become aware that there are... Um, you know, health, ongoing disparities related to many aspects of healthcare where people are not receiving equitable uh, care or where the diagnosis may be more common in uh, one group or another. Are there disparities uh, related to bladder cancer that we should be aware of? Uh, there are. Um, the most pressing one, I think, um, comes um, with gender disparities. Mm-hmm. So, unfortunately, um, even though men are more commonly diagnosed with bladder cancer, women are diagnosed with worse disease and they have mm. poorer survival than men. And there are lots of reasons for these, um, these observations. Um, there are higher rates of urinary tract infections in women and that can mimic symptoms of bladder cancer. So there may be delays in that regard. There's lots of reasons for bleeding, particularly postmenopausal bleeding mm-hmm. uh, in that population, which, which may confound um, the urologic evaluation or delay the urologic evaluation. Um, and so unfortunately, there are survival disparities that are observed uh, in women as a result of uh, some of these issues. There's also um, income-related disparities, particularly um, a decade ago, there were, there were more um, income-related disparities uh, with respect to access to care. Um, but um, we know that patients living in poorer counties present with more advanced disease, probably from delays in their care. Um, and, and, then, and then lastly, we know that there are some racial disparities as well. Hispanics do worse than non-Hispanics in terms of survival. African-American men and women um, particularly have a higher mortality risk, um, particularly in that late stage disease uh, group. They have a higher rate of non-urethelial carcinoma. So oh. the, the variant histologies that we talked about, higher grade, higher stage um, compared with the Caucasian cohorts as well. So there definitely are disparities to be cognizant of. In general, in my experience, if we can get um, those patients on therapy quickly, um, um, the response rates seem to be as good and, and, and um, with, with prompt attention, um, survival expectations can be just as good. Anything else that you'd like our listeners to be aware of today? There, there is something that we didn't cover that I think is really important. Um, and that is when we remove the bladder, what do we do with the urine? A lot of times patients will say, well, what's going to happen to me after yes. I take out my bladder? Because that's how I, that's how I avoid. Um, and, and that's an exciting area of research too. That's of special interest to me because for the longest time, we haven't really had good data to present to patients to say, okay, well, here are your options. And this is what I think is best. But what oftentimes I was telling my, my, uh, my wife this last night, oftentimes what we think is best isn't what's best mm-hmm. uh, for patients. It's really what patients think is best. And we need to arm patients with better data to make those decisions. But there are two predominant options in this space. Um, really three, but there's the third one that's not commonly performed. Um, there, there's the take out the bladder and build a bag like a urostomy uh, mm. for urine. There's t- take out the bladder and then insert a new bladder and neal bladder. We call that orthotopic bladder substitution. It just means you're putting a bladder substitute back where the old one was located. And then there's a pouch, a continent catheterizable stoma. And that's where a patient will have a stoma at the, at the level of the skin and catheterize it to empty it. So it's mostly continent, um, but, but there can be issues related to leakage with that, with that system. But suffice it to say, the conversation that goes into this decision-making process is long and arduous, mm-hmm. oftentimes requires plenty, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of months to think about it as patients on chemotherapy. They're doing research, talking to patients. What I would encourage patients to do is to, to, to seek out people who've already had the surgery. 
because um, the vast majority of things that doctor thinks that the doctor thinks are important really aren't the things that patients identify as being important. And so sometimes talking to somebody who's been down the path of a neobladder can speak to the challenges of a neobladder, like incontinence. And patients who've been down the, the path of ileoconduits where you, you, know, you have a stoma, they can speak to the challenges of, of ileoconduits. Uh, and so the last thing I would just impress upon our listeners is, is don't hesitate to reach out to, to, to patients. And you can find these patients at places um, like in our practice. We often have patients who are volunteering to do that. But we also have really good organizations like the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network um, that, that, that house a, a repository of, of patient contact information that, that can help with these decision-making processes. I'm still stuck on the, that you find urine exciting. I, I, I loved yeah. you saying that because you really do not realize how much we take the very simple things of life for granted until they're not so simple anymore. And how we urinate <laughs> is a big deal um, to someone who would lose the, the ability to do it naturally. So yeah. that was great. Yes. Thank you, Mark, so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to participate. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share the exciting things going on at Mayo Clinic. And, and so I hope that this helps your listeners um, uh, with their um, journey uh, with, with bladder cancer. Well, one of my favorite things about doing this is all the, the wonderful um, things that I learn and the wonderful providers that I get to meet. So thank you for being here. We really appreciate that. It's nice to meet you too. Our thanks to Dr. Mark Tyson, urologist at Mayo Clinic in Arizona, for coming to speak with us today about bladder cancer. May is Bladder Cancer Awareness Month, so be aware, and if you need to seek help uh, for signs or symptoms of bladder cancer or know someone who does, um, please do that. I hope that you learned something today. I know that I certainly did, and we wish all of you a very wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.